Uh, bless the Lord, everyone, and welcome to another in our Bible study. Um, as you know, the topic is the mind of Christ. Um, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here one more time. We pray that your presence will be here with us, that it will lead us and it will guide us. Have your own way as we give you all the glory. You alone is worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so let us do a quick revision of what some of the things that we would have covered in our last um, session. So last week we looked at, you know, the, we looked at the nature of Christ. And, you know, we made a point that he was very much God and that he was also man. So um, scholars say that he had a dual, dual nature. He was both Lord and Christ. Um, we looked at some scriptures that clearly state that Jesus was God, or is God. Um, and we also looked at his testimony, because that is essential, you know. Um, in all of this, if Jesus didn't say he was God, then, you know, we wouldn't have a case. But he... Um, from the scriptures, you know, he emphatically indicated that he was God, or he is God. And um, not only did he say it verbally, but then his word also substantiate that fact. We looked at some other aspect of things that, you know, would um, help us to further confirm that he was God. One of which was that he, he, he forgave sin, and that was a big one, you know. He forgives sin. The Pharisee says it's only God alone can forgive sin, and they were right. But Jesus forgave sin was an indication that he was God manifested in the flesh. We also looked at the fact that he received worship, or he accepted worship. And not only did he accept worship, but he encouraged worship. He, he encouraged and almost demanded that he be worshipped. Um, other scriptures in the Bible, we see where even angels were saying that, you know, it is unlawful to accept worship because they weren't God. But Jesus himself, he encouraged worship and he ac certainly accepted worship. In this class, we are going to, in this session, we're going to continue looking at Jesus Christ and we're going to continue looking at um, some other aspect of Christ. So we you know, last week we spoke about him being the I am. You know, him being the I am. And the I am really means that, you know, he, is, he had limitless potential. You know, he could do whatever he, um, we want, he wanted to do. You know, he could do whatever he wanted to do. He, was, he had limitless potential. You know, there was no restriction on him. Um, and this was what he was indicating when he said to Moses, you know, I am that I am. Go tell the children of Israel that the I am have sent thee. So he was making the point that, you know, he, he has limitless potential, really. Um, now, when we look at Jesus, Jesus also claimed to be the I am. You know, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews again, they took up stones to stone him because of that statement that he made. Um, because they understood that what he was actually saying, that he was actually equating himself to the very God of the Old Testament. So as I said before, as the I am, as the I am, he had limitless potential. However, what we find somewhat in the Old Testament, but especially with Jesus, Jesus described himself using terms that are essential to our existence. And, and I believe he does this because he wants us to know and to, and to recognize that we need him. And so he used terms that are essential to our 
um, existence. He used words like, you know, bread of life. Jesus is describing himself as, a bre- as the bread of life because he knows that as human, you know, we are dependent on the physical food. And if we um, don't eat the physical bread, which bread here is representing our food, you know, we will, we will eventually die. But he's saying that he's the bread of life. So he is equating himself to say, I am as, as necessary to you as your bread. So we're going to look at some of these statements that he made. We're going to also look at some of the, some of the I am statements that is made throughout the scriptures. And we're going to go through them and to have a better understanding of who Jesus is. Amen? So let us um, move on to the next slide. And the first one we want to look at is in John 7, verse 37. That is St. John 7, verse 37. So I'll give you some time to find it in your Bibles. Um, I would encourage you, even though it's online, I would, co- I would encourage you to use your Bible because we're going to be using the Bible a lot today. So, you know, it would be good to have your Bible with you. Um, so it is St. John 7, verse 37. A very well-known scripture You know, but we're going to just look at it today. That is um, St. John, St. John 7, verse 37. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read this one. So, in the last day, the Bible said, that great day of the feast... Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. So, um, if you look back at the slide, we'll see that, you know, Jesus, the reference is is made of a feast. The Bible says, in the last day, and he, he, he make mention that, that great day of the feast. Now, we're going to look at Leviticus 23, verse 36. You know, to, um, in fact, there's a couple of scriptures I want you to look at. Leviticus 23, verse 36, um, Nehemiah 8, verse 18, and Isaiah 12, verse 3. So that we can just have a better understanding of this feast that is making ref- Jesus is making reference to. So we know that there are, there are seven feasts of Jehovah, I believe. And then the, this is one of those seven feasts that is being referenced here. Now, now the, the scripture said, Leviticus 23 verse 36... So this is the description that the Lord himself gave with regards to this feast that um, Jesus was at. As I said before, it was the Feast of Tabernacle. That's what the the feast is called, the Feast of Tabernacle. Um, Most scholars agree that this was the feast that was being referenced here. Now, 
36 says, Seven days he shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So he is so so God is telling them, Israel, what they should be doing, you know, during this feast. So he's saying that seven days he shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And on the eighth day shall and on the eighth day, on the eighth day rather, shall be an holy convocation unto you. And he shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, assembly and he shall do no service or that said servile work therein. Um, so Isaiah, Nehemiah 8 verse 18 also make reference of, to this feast. And it said also day by day from the first day unto the last day he read in the book of the law of God and they kept the feast seven days and on the eighth day was a, a, a solemn assembly according unto the manner. So we can look at those two. So, so, so Jesus said that it was on the last day. Um, scholars argue whether the last day here was being referenced to was the seventh day or was it the eighth day. Most, however, agree that it probably was this, the eighth day of the feast, that solemn day where the Bible speaks about it being um, a great day, a special day. You know, um, historical documents suggest that the priests would gather water from the pool of Salem, of um, Siloam, and pour it on the altar. So the Bible speaks about, you know, sacrifices being done every day of the feast. But then um, historical documents said that this was also observed, you know, especially in the first century. Um, next slide, please. So on the eighth day, and as I said, the last day, it was the great day because it was a special day of the feast. The Bible said Jesus made a passionate appeal. Does any man thirst? So he made an, um, a passionate appeal. Now, implicit in this appeal is the notion that the religious audiences and the ceremonies that they would have participated in up until this time did not satisfy them. Why, why did he wait until the last day of the feast? You know? And especially a feast that is believed to be, you know, entrenched with the use of water. You know, they use water a lot in this feast. And, the, the, and, and so Jesus waited until they would have done their religious audiences, you know, they, 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 and they would have done their ceremonies. And then he's saying that, you know, after all this, after all you have done, you know, is there anyone that is thirsty? Is there anyone that is unfulfilled? You know, he is saying implicitly here that sometimes the things that we do, our religious audiences, really does not satisfy us. You know, it really doesn't satisfy us. And so he is making appeal, if any man thirst, you know, um, obviously he was speaking of the natural thirst here. So, we, so he's not speaking now of the physical thirst because the physical thirst would have been quenched. But a spiritual one, a longing for God, so it is a longing for God or just a longing in general. You know? Next slide, please. We're going to look some more at, at this use of the word. So, um, so the, this thirst here is speaking about a hunger. Um, you know, it's speaking about a longing. It is kind of similar to what David described in, this, in Psalms 52 when he said, you know, David described it as uh, disquietness. 
of the soul, he said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? You know? Um, and he went on to say, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of um, his countenance. He went on to describe this longing that he's feeling inside um, that we are saying is similar to the thirst. As, you know, um, he said, as a heart panted, or the heart is similar to a deer, panted after the water brooks. So panted my soul after thee, O God. So he's saying that, you know, his, his soul is thirsty. He's describing the feeling he has inside as a great thirst that a heart or, or a deer would have for the natural water. And he's saying, so is my soul thirsty for God. He said, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? You know, so this is... In general, you know what we're talking about when we talk about a hunger and a thirst. And Jesus was a, making an emphatic appeal to the crowd. It was not for everyone. It was only for those who had a thirst, a longing inside. You know, it was specifically to those that he was speaking to. You know, he, Jesus went on to say that, you know, this thirst is a requirement um, for righteousness. So in the book of Matthew 5 and verse 6, um, you know, it, it is said that um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so in order for you, us to have righteousness, in, in order for us to acquire righteousness, the first and initial thing that we must have is a hunger and a thirst year for it, right? A hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Okay, let us move on. So Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you drink. Come unto me. Um, he said, he that believeth in me as the scripture has said, out of, his, out of his most innermost being shall flow rivers. And notice he used the plural form of the verb is used here. Rivers, or the noun rather, is used here. Rivers of living water. You know? So Jesus is saying that I am going to, if you believe on me, as the scripture said, you ought to believe on me, then out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. For those of us who are filled with the Spirit, you know, we do not need to look to external source for motivation. So, we, you know, sometimes as Christians, yes, we, are, we have received this wonderful experience that Jesus was speaking about here. But sometimes there is a longing within. You know, sometimes there is a hunger and a thirst. And it is natural, as it were, for us to look external to quench this thirst. You know, we want to, sometimes there are those who invest in relationships to try and quench this, this inner thirst that they are feeling. There are those who seek to acquire material possession to quench this thirst. And the list goes on. But Jesus is saying, we don't need to look to those other things in order to be satisfied. We can look within the spirit of Christ that is within us for, for the inspiration and the, motiva and the motivation, you know, that we need to bring forth satisfaction, right? So we don't need to be looking elsewhere. Jesus is all in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying that, you know, yes, after we go to church, 
you can go to church and still feel thirst, a longing in the soul. You can still feel unfulfilled in the spirit. That, is, that can happen. You know, you can do the religious ceremonies. You can, you know, go through the, the you know, the things that we do at church. And at the end of it all, you are still, there is still a longing in your soul. But he's saying that if you come to him, especially if you are not saved, if you come to him, he will fill you with the Holy Ghost and that will satisfy you. And if you are filled, then you need to just look within you and to continue drink from this reverse plural form that Jesus has placed in us. Okay? So notice, he, notice the same sentiment is echoed to the woman at the well. And let us look at, let us go to the next slide. So, it, so in St. John 4, 4 verse 13, it gives the, you know, well, St. John 4 on a whole gave the account of the woman at the well. Now, similar to this religious group, you know, so first he spoke to the religious persons because these people at the feast would have been the religious leaders and the Jews on a whole who was religious. And he's saying to them, yes, you are religious, but at the end of the day, what you are doing now is not going to quench your thirst. You have to come to me and I will give you the Holy Ghost that is able to quench your thirst. So this is his message to the religious leaders back then. It is the same message he has for this woman of, I mean, questionable character, you would, you would, you would say. You know, the Bible speaks about her having, um, I think, having five husband, husband or had had five husband. And the, and the husband or the person that she was living with now was not her husband. Um, you know, and they, but, but, but Jesus' message to the religious leader was the same message he has for this woman that was a sinner. Somebody that, you know, everyone would, everyone would recognize to be a sinner. He said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, speaking now of that, of that well that they were at, shall thirst again. So he's saying that you're going to thirst when you drink of the natural water. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So again, Jesus is, is making reference that he's going to put something within us that is going to not only quench our thirst, as it has said, but it will also give us everlasting life. Now, do you believe that? Do we believe that? Mankind on a whole have sought without success for a formula to live forever. You know, nobody wants to die. And every, every, every old person would probably give all their wealth that they would have acquired if they can repurchase their youth and start over from scratch. But here Jesus is giving us the only formula for everlasting life or to live forever. He's saying that you have to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if we thirst, so after we have received the Holy Ghost, if we thirst, if we are cast down in spirit like David, you know, if we are depressed, depressed then it, it, it is probably an indication that we are not truly drinking from this, these rivers that, you know, the Lord would have placed in us. And that is based on, you know, the scriptures only. That's not me saying this. This is the Bible itself saying it. Because he said, whosoever drinketh, and the word drinketh here implies continuously drink 
from this river that is within them will always have that refreshing and will never thirst. That's what, you know, Jesus is saying here. Next slide, please. So let us speak a little bit more about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, I believe, is God's response to a tremendous blow dealt to humanity by the devil. You will recall when, when Satan caused man to sin. Sin had tainted humanity to the point where he's almost unrecognizable when compared to the moral and upright and perfect being that God had created. We see, um, we see the, the prophet, I think it was Isaiah, the prophet say, Woe unto me, because I am undone. You know, I am incomplete. I am degraded by sin. And so, the impact of sin, we can see. You know, you just need to turn on the news. And you will see the impact of sin. Man has become like a beast. He has become so cruel, so wicked. You know, the things that man will do to another man is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And this does not reflect the righteousness of God that, you know, that was there when God first created man. When God first created man, he was good. He was perfect. He was, you know, he was like God. He was, he bare the image of God. The righteousness of God was upon him. And he was perfect when it comes to his character, his personality, his thoughts. He was perfect. But sin has, sin has destroyed all of that. And now mankind is like a filthy rag before the Lord. You know? The Bible says that at one point that it repented the Lord that he has made man. That's how far reaching sin has been in the life of man. But the Holy Ghost has the capacity to undo that effect. The Holy Ghost can reverse the impact that sin has had on humanity. And, and, and let me say this, the, only, the Holy Ghost is the only thing, is the really and truly the only thing that can reverse, you know, that degrading process that mankind has gone through. So the Holy Ghost is able to do that and to transform us into a creature that is morally upright and resembles that original man that was created in the image and the likeness of God. If there was ever a panacea, if there is ever a silver bullet, if there was, any, if there was ever a single thing that is the proverbial fix all, then certainly the Holy Ghost is that thing. The Bible said it is God gives unto man. When, when, when man sinned and God see, saw the impact of sin on humanity, you know, God came up with this strategy to reverse that impact. And the strategy that he chose is said that he's going to give us a gift. He calls it the gift of God. And it will give us eternal life, but it will, also, it will also reverse the impact of sin and make us into a creature that God is able to have communion with, you know, and to respect and to enjoy the company of. You know, so I mean, I can't, can't, I can't um, say um, enough how important it is for you to receive the Holy Ghost and how and the great role 
that the Holy Ghost play. And so here Jesus describing himself as the, the source, or I said the fountain of living water, but he's really the, the source, he's really the source of, of that river that he's going to place within us. Um, continue. Um, another, another way he described himself in scripture is as the bread of life. And let us look at the scripture in St. John 6, verse 23, sorry, verse 26 to 33. So that is... St. John 6, verse 26 to 33. Let us read it. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He seek me, not because he saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. So this was just after Jesus had miraculously used the, the two fishes and the five loaves to feed the multitude. There was these persons that were seeking him, and he's saying to them that, you're not seeking me because you see the miracles, and you are impressed, but you are seeking me because you, you ate of the food that I provided, and, and you were filled and so you want to stick with me because you know that if you stick with me, you will always have food to eat. So Jesus pointed that out, that his motivation was wrong. Pointed it out to the man. And he said to the man, labor not for the meat which perish. Right? Jesus said, labor not for the meat or that thing that perish, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for, for him hath God the Father sealed. Continue. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the work of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that he shall he that he believe on him who he has sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What does what does thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the, the true bread from heaven. Continue. For the bread of God is he which which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So here Jesus is describing himself as the bread of life that came down from God. Now we know the story about how God caused manna to rain from heaven. And how this was essential for the Jews um, at a time that they really didn't have much anything to eat. You know, you know, Jesus rained down, God rather rained down manna from heaven so that they could have what to eat. Now Jesus was, so, so, so the Pharisees are, the Jews are saying, you know, this was a big, this is a big sign. This was a big sign to us. You know, for us to believe in Moses and for us to believe in God. This was a big sign that he, 
you know, he rained down manna as it was from heaven. And so Jesus said to them, look here, the true manna that come down from heaven is not that that happened back then in the wilderness. No, he's saying, look here, I am the true manna. I am that bread. I am the true bread that come down from heaven. So if you are seeking for a sign, I am that sign. So the Bible says the Jews were puzzled at his statement. They were, they were puzzled at his statement. And then some of, them, some, some of them said, well, how can this man say that he came from heaven? Isn't this Joseph? Isn't this Joseph's son? You know, and his mother, we know. So how, how say it that he, he came down from heaven? They didn't understand. Um, let us read verse 41 um, to 42. That is... St. John, um, John 6, verse 41 to 42. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Right? So they are saying that, you know, this is Joseph, we know him. Why is he saying that he came down from heaven? Um, but if, let us go back to the slide. So, so they didn't understood what he said. Now, if you think that was bad, now this was even worse. If you look at St. John 6 and verse 53 to 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except he eat my flesh, except he eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, he have no life in you. So that's what, so, so, so Jesus, so they were already baffled at his statement. And now Jesus is making it, as it were, worse. He's saying, look here, except you eat my flesh, because I am the bread that came down from God. Except you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink. Indeed. Now, what, does, what did Jesus mean by you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood? What is he speaking about? You know, last week I asked for some persons to, to give, um, to type some feedback in the, in the chat. And we, I've, I've actually read them. And, you know, I see where persons have actually typed some, you know, their feedback. And so I'm asking again, what do you believe this is reference to? You know, how, how can we eat his flesh and drink his blood? How do, how do we do that? Is this, make, is this a reference to communion? Or is this something else that, that Jesus is talking about? Has, has you, you know, we have professed to be Christians. Have we eaten his flesh and have we drink of his blood? You know, have you done that? Do you have eternal life in you? You know, as I said, I love the feedback. So if you can type and let us know what you're thinking, then that would be, 
then that would be good. But let us go back to the slide. And I'll tell you what is my view of this. So, so I believe that Jesus was speaking metaphorically. You know, it wasn't, it's not to be taken literally. Um, but he was speaking about, metaphorically, about participating in the salvation plan. You know, notice he said that when we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we are going to have eternal life in us. We know that, or we know that the, the gospel or the plan of salvation, the end result of that is that it gives us eternal life. And so, Jesus procured eternal life for us through his flesh. It's through his flesh that was broken for us, for us that he procured our salvation. And it was through the shedding of his blood, you know, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So it is through the shedding of blood, the shedding of his blood, that we are able to receive repentance from our sin. And so I personally believe to eat the flesh and to drink the blood is, is, is reference to participating in the gospel. You know, the Bible speaks about in Acts 2.38... It speaks about repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I believe that is when we have done this, when we have repent of our sin, when we have baptized in his name and when we have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, then we have participated in eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. Because these things, as I said before, were procured by him through his flesh and by his blood. So that is what I believe. As I said, you can type and let me know your view of it. I know some folks believe it's probably speaking about communion. But I believe it goes a bit deeper than that. And it really ties back to the, the, the gospel plan. But let us know what you think. Next slide. Now the next statement that Jesus made. As I said, we are looking at a couple of the statements that he made. So the next statement that Jesus made was that I am the way or he is the way. Um, let us read St. John 14, verse 1 to 6, so that we can receive the context, get the context of this statement. So St. John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. He believed in God, Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, are there are rooms, are space. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, Jesus is saying, and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto me, unto myself rather, that where I am, there he may be also. Now, Jesus went on to say, and whether I go, he know. And the way he know. So Jesus said, you know where I'm going, and you know the way. Next. Thomas, and I, I love Thomas, Thomas said, said unto him, Lord, we know not where, whether you 
we know not whether thou goest. So, 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 so he's saying, forget the old English, he's saying, we don't know where you go. I don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? If we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way? So Thomas was saying, well, God, you say, we know, you know, we know where you're going and we know the way, but I don't know the way. And this is what caused Jesus to make this statement. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can cometh unto the Father but by, but by me. No man can come to the Father. If he had known me, he should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, yeah, we can stop here. So back to the slide. So, so this is what, what caused Jesus to make this declaration that he is the way. And so here, from the context of the scripture, what Jesus was saying was that if you want to go to heaven, then I am the way. I am the way to go to heaven. Right? Let us look back at the, the slide here. Um, in fact, let us look at another scripture. Um, so Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, so, so he's saying that if you, know, if you want to go to heaven, then I am the way. And notice again, as in all the I am statements, he uses the definite article. He's saying that I am the way, not I am a way, but I am the way. He's saying there is no other way. You can't go to heaven no other way except through Jesus. Now, when we look at um, in the Old Testament, Jacob had a dream of a ladder, and I believe that this captures succinctly what Jesus was saying. It gives us like a pictorial view of what Jesus was saying in this, in this dream that Jacob had. And we can find it in Genesis 28 and verse 12. In Genesis, the Bible said, and he dreamed, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heaven, and behold, the angel of God ascending and descending on it. So we can, we can go to the, other, the next scripture that kind of give us the interpretation, and that is in John 1, verse 51. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, excuse me, hereafter he shall see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man or upon Jesus. So it's like he's giving that interpretation to that scripture. So Jesus is saying that, look here, I am like that ladder, metaphorically, that stretch from the earth to heaven. And if it is that you want to go to heaven, you have to go through me. I am the way. I am like the pathway. You have to go to heaven through me. There is no other way to get to heaven but through Christ, through Jesus Christ. So here he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, and I think, I believe we're going to look at our final I am statement. We're not going to go through all of them. No, this is, the, this is the penultimate one, actually. Yes. Um, so this one we're going to do quite a, a bit of, a, of reading here again. So let us turn to John, John 11, St. John 11, and we're going we're gonna to be doing a bit, of a bit of reading. Yes. 
well, it is Bible study, so, you know, it's good that we spend some time in the scripture itself. Sometimes when you preach, you just, you just read a scripture and then put the Bible aside and then ex exhort on it, you know. But in Bible study, we have the opportunity to spend more time looking in the word. Now, let us start at verse 1. So, St. John 11, verse 1. Now, the Bible says, A certain man was sick, um, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord, the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with his hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So notice the relationship with the family was at such that she didn't even, they didn't even have to specify that is Lazarus. You know, they, they could have simply say, you know, him whom thou lovest is sick. And Jesus would know that it was Lazarus. So, so that was the relationship with them. You would also recall that before this had have happened, you know, Jesus would have gone to their, house, to, to, to their house and was ministering unto them. You know, you'd recall that Mary would sat at Jesus' feet and Martha was, you know, overwhelmed as it were with serving. And Martha would have made the request for Mary to leave from Jesus' feet and to come and help with the serving. And Jesus said, no, Mary, Mary, uh, Martha, Martha, thou art um, worried about a lot of things, to paraphrase. But there's only one thing that is really important. And this is the one thing that Mary has chosen. And we, I'm not going to take that from her. So this was the, the first mention, I believe, of those of the relationship that exists between Martha, Mary, Jesus, and Lazarus. So here now, Lazarus is sick. And, you know, it is, you know, they, I guess they, they see themselves in a privileged position because of their friendship with Jesus. And so they sent and tell Jesus that, you know, this person, this young man that, you know, Jesus would have, was a, a friend with Jesus, was sick. The Bible says when Jesus but for the glory but for the glory of God that the son of God might be glorified thereby. So Jesus was saying that Jesus was saying that was that the sickness is not going to terminate his life permanently. That's what Jesus was saying. And he would probably would have said it to the person that came to him and made the request. And maybe the person would have gone back to Martha and Mary and told her, told them that everything is all right because Jesus said the sickness is not unto death. Now, what they received from it was that Lazarus, or what they would receive from it, from a natural, is that Lazarus was not going to die. But he was going to get better. They would have received that as a word. Right? Continue. Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard therefore. Notice he said the therefore is there. So when he heard therefore. Because he loved them. That's what that therefore is linking it back in him. Because he loved them. When he heard therefore that they were sick, he aborted two days, still in the same place where he was. So, Jesus expressed him love differently, you know. Most of us, if we love somebody and hear that they're sick, and we know we can't help them, we would have moved with... Haste. 
right? You don't move with haste. But Jesus didn't do that. He, he, he tarried, intentionally tarried. He waited because he loved them. And this is very instructive. And I believe I said it before, but it is very instructive because a lot of time we pray and we believe that God delay answering us. And we say, boy, God no love us. But sometimes he delay answering us because he loved us. As what is happening here. So Jesus said, you know, I'm going to wait because I love them. Continue. Said he to his disciple, let us go into Judea again. So he waited two days, and then he said, let us go into Judah again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou hither again? So Jesus, the request that was made of Jesus, was, could cost him his life. Because the Jews were planning to stone him. And so, you know, his disciples were concerned. The disciples were saying, you know, you don't have to go. The disciples would have seen him send a word before and heal somebody. There was a man that came to Jesus and said his daughter was sick. And Jesus said, come, let us go to, to the man's daughter. And the man said, you don't have to come, you know. You can't just send a word because... He understand a certain principle, which, which I won't go into now. But the Bible said, Jesus marveled at the man's faith and said, look here, all right, the, your daughter is healed. So they know that he could have done that. He didn't have to go. He could have just sent a word. Continue. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. Continue. But if a man walketh in, night, in, the, in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Ne ne next. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So, he would have remembered that he said to his disciples, the, the man is not going to die. And as I said before, he was saying, the man, this is not going to be the end of it. You know, he's not going to be permanently die, killed or terminated. But, you know, as I said, they would have received it to say that, well, you know, this sickness is not going to, cut, not, not going to lead to the man's death. But now Jesus discerned in his spirit are, you know, he's the omniscient one, so he knows everything. So he know now that the man is dead. So he said, the man sleepeth. And they said, well, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So they thought that he was taking a rest and sleep. Then said his disciple, Lord, if, if he sleep, he shall do well. Next slide. How be it Jesus spake of his death? But they thought he had spoken of taking a, of a rest in sleep. Continue. Then said Jesus unto them, Plainly, Lazarus is dead. Con next slide. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there, to the intent he may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. S then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, Unto his fellow disciples. Let us also go. That we may die with him. So Thomas was. Um, he was concerned about his life. He was concerned. That the Jews might just not stone Jesus alone. But that he may just stone all of them. So Thomas said. Alright we're going to go. So we can die with him. Now. So when Jesus came, he found that he had, Lazarus was in the grave for four days. 
you know, he was in the grave for four days. That means he probably died just after the man came to him. Now, Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlong off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. So Martha went to meet him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother would not die. So can you continue. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, um, God will give it thee. So Martha, Martha wasn't so bad, you know. Martha said, Martha said, Martha said, if if I, yes, so Martha said, Lord, I know that if you were here, my brother would not have died. So notice, notice that, notice that he was, they were, they had, they had extreme confidence. In, in his ability to heal the sick. So Martha was saying, look here, I know for a fact, if you were here, Jesus, my brother would not die. I believe that you were able to heal him. So they were making that point, that Jesus was able to heal the sick. Now we know that he probably wasn't cold he has, it probably wasn't fever, it probably wasn't a headache. Probably was something serious because the thing ultimately ended his life. So it was a, 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 severe, a, a severe sickness, a, a bad enough sickness. But Martha was saying that, you know, I know that if you were here, I believe that you, you know, you, you could have healed him. And when you read the undertone, it seemed as if Martha was saying, boy, if he didn't just come when we call you, you know, if he had just came, then Lazarus would not have died. I don't know why you would tarry Jesus because you loved him, you know? So that's, that, that's the, the type of undertone that was there, you know? But then she went on to say, but I know that even at this moment, if you should ask anything of God, then God will do it. Now, what was she saying there? She was saying that there was hope. She was saying that there was hope. You know, she was saying that there is the possibility that God could, could raise him from the dead. Because, you know, that's what she said. She said, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give thee. So she was kind of confessing that, you know, God could actually, God should, could actually um, resurrect him. So the question I ask, why did they bury him then? Why did she bury him? And was the fact that they buried him, did that show a lack of faith on their part? Because Jesus had sent a word to them and said, thy brother shall not die. That's what Jesus, and the assumption here is that the man would have returned and say and tell them that. So they would have received that word. So when he, when he got sick, you know, when he's sick, they said, you know, Jesus said he's not going to die. He got that word from Jesus himself. It's not like there was, it's not like some position that we find ourselves in sometimes when we don't have a word and we just believe God, you know, in the, in the absence of a word. We just have faith that 
that God will heal. Or, you know, but we don't get a sure word from God. That wasn't the case with them. They had a sure word. The man would have returned and said, God said, he's not going to die. So even, you know, if we should look at the natural thing, as he probably got worse, they probably had that in their heart to say, yeah, fever get more or he might get sick. Maybe he, could, maybe he was able to walk around, but now he's bedridden. He's getting worse. But in the back of their heart, they were probably saying, well, God said he's not going to die. So they had that as a hope. And he probably get worse. And they probably say, boy, yes, he's getting worse. But I have confidence that God is going to see me through. And they probably, you know, believe that the man would not die. Because of the word that Jesus gave them. Now you can imagine what it did to their feet. When the man actually died. When he took his last breath. Martha probably said, you sure? You sure? Let me, let, me, let me test him upon him. Put it on upon him again, man. Put on the test upon him one more time. Because Jesus said that the sickness is not unto death. So let me take him pulse one more time. Pump him chest one more time. Because I believe the word. And that probably go on. She probably was in denial as the world would have caused to call it. For a period of time. Until him get cold. His body start get cold. He can't deny that he die anymore. Because his body get cold. And so it must have, it must have um, messed with their, with their faith and their belief. And they, they probably wondered and said, but is this, is, is this man true? There is a proverb, an old proverb. There's a proverb that is, in, that is out there that says, even one lie is enough for you to question all truth. So, this Jesus would have told them, they probably go back to the man and say, Look here, you're sure Jesus say that the sickness is not unto death. Okay? So they, they buried him. In my heart, in my mind, it sounds like they, they accepted it. And However, they rationalize it. Maybe the man never hear good what Jesus said. You know? However, they rationalize it for it not to destroy their faith. They probably would have done that. But here it is now that the man was dead. And Jesus said the man would not die. And now he's dead. Um... Next scripture. Thy brother Jesus said unto her Thy brother shall rise again. So Jesus said Thy brother shall rise again. Next verse. Martha said unto him I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection and at the last day. So, so Jesus said to her, when Jesus said to her, thy brother shall rise again, Jesus was saying that I am going to raise him from the dead. No, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, that, that is why I came. I'm going to raise him from the dead. He's going to rise again. She believed that Jesus was making reference to when all, you know, at the resurrection, when all people are going to be raised from the dead. And hearing Jesus made that faithful statement, he said, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and uh, the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So Jesus was saying that 
He's giving us some truth here. He's saying that I am the resurrection. When he said that I am the resurrection, he's saying that when at that last day, when the trump of God shall sound, and all of those folks that is going to raise from the dead, it is me that is going to raise them. Every single one of them, I am going to raise them from the dead. I am the resurrection. I am the one that is going to cause the resurrection to happen. I am the one that is going to call everybody back. Just like how I'm now getting ready to call up back Lazarus. So that's what was Jesus was saying. Continue, continue. I know it's a lot of reading. I don't know. I hope I'm not boring you, but I like reading the Bible. And sometimes the Bible explains itself. You know? And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe it thou this? Jesus said to her, Martha, do you believe that I am the resurrection? Do you believe that I am the life? When he said that I am the life, and he was making that distinction that he was life-giving. If you recall, the, 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 the Bible said in Corinthians that the first Adam was made a living soul. So when God breathed into that first Adam, that first Adam became a living soul. You know? But the second Adam was made a quickening or a life-giving spirit. So that is one of the major differences between the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam was alive. The second Adam was able to give life. And so that's what Jesus was, making, was saying here. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the one that will cause people to be alive. You know, there is life breathing in me. I can give life. When he, when he said, if you don't praise me, I, you know, I will raise up these rocks. He was essentially saying that, look here, I can make these rocks alive if I want to. I am life breathing. So he said, um, believe as thou this. She said unto him, yea, Lord. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So she said, you know, she believed that he was the Christ, the Son of God. Continue. So, and, and when she had said this, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly. <laughs> so, she, and said, the master is come and he called it for thee. Because... She now start have hope, you know. Say, Lazarus is going to be raised, you know. But she don't want to tell Martha everything. So she said, look here. The master come and call it for thee. Let us continue. As soon as she heard that, Mary arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come unto the town. So he wasn't in the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. So he was in... The vicinity, but not wasn't in the town. Continue. Jesus then, which were Jesus, Jesus then, which were with her, oh, the Jews then. Sorry, sometimes I get excited, and though we don't read properly, the Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up and hastily and went out, followed her, saying. She goeth to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, just like how Martha said, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. So it's kind of strange. It sounds as if she was worshipping him. But I said, there's this, this undertone to say, yeah, your fault. If it didn't just come, you know, that's what I'm getting. But as I said, type and let me know if you feel that they were, you know, there was that little undertone there. But let us continue. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. I can't understand this scripture. Why was Jesus groaning in the spirit and why was he troubled? Because he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But it seemed as if their, their emotions and 
the hurt that they were feeling. He was feeling that hurt. You understand? The hurt they were feeling. He, he was feeling that hurt with them. That's how I explain it. I don't think he was troubled because Lazarus was dead. But, you know, he was hurting when, because they were hurting. When we hurt, he hurts also. The Bible says that he is touched with the feelings. The Bible said he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And I think that's what was happening here. He could feel their pain. And he had, he had, he, he, you know, he, he, had, he, he had compassion on them. So he, he was troubled because they were troubled. And he groaned because they were hurting. Continue. And said, where has he laid him? So he groaned in the spirit and he said, where has he laid him? They said unto, unto him, Lord, come and see. So he asked them, where have you laid him? So, you know, I believe the ultimate fate would have been for them not to bury him. And said, look here, if him stink up the house, make him stink up the house. May I wait? Jesus said, I'm not going to die. I'm not bury him. But maybe good sense prevail. And they buried him. As I said, could be, you know, burying, when you bury somebody, it's like, they say, give you closure. When you bury somebody, you know, it gives you closure. So they accepted. They accepted it. They accepted that Lazarus was dead. They accepted that, you know, something went wrong with what Jesus said. Jesus said he wasn't going to die, but he's dead. And we accept it and we just move on. We can't explain it, you know. But we just have to move on. So they, were, so they received closure. And they accepted that Lazarus was dead. And this is the end. In their mind. That's what they thought. Let us read the next scripture. And the shortest scripture in the Bible. Jesus wept. Again, I believe it had to do with the grief. The grief, the grief uh, that they were grieving that they were hurting, that I believe it had to do with the pain that they were feeling. It probably had nothing to do with the fact that Lazarus was dead, but just the hurt that they were feeling. He was feeling their hurt, and he wept because they were so sorrowful, and he felt the pain, the, the, the emotional pain that they were feeling was what got to him, I believe. But that's just my opinion. Because the Bible didn't say why he wept. Then said, then said the Jew, Behold how he loved him. So the Jew said, Behold how he loved him. And then the next sentence, And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not die? So they were blaming Jesus. Them said, yeah man, him opened the eyes of the blind. Me believe, say, him probably could have caused that this man should not die. So there was that undertone there. And then the Jews finally come out and just say, it. continue. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself. Cometh to the grave, it was a cave and a stone laid upon it. So them put a stone over it, you know, them, them done, them seal it, probably put the cement around it, block it up, and them say, me accepted, me accept that Jesus, that Lazarus died. And me accept, say, something wrong with what Jesus did say. They accepted it. So Jesus therefore again grown in his spirit. Oh yeah, we read this one. Next slide. Jesus said, take he away the stone. Now Martha of all persons, of all the persons, Martha, the one that said, God, 
if you were here, my brother would not die. But I believe that if you should ask anything of God, he will do it. Martha that just said that the same day, probably just a, probably an hour or a few minutes ago, Martha said, Martha, the sister, notice the Bible, even the Bible making it. Say, is the man, the, is the man own sister? Said, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead for four days. So Martha said, <laughs> can't deal with this. <laughs> Martha said, I can't deal with it. I can't begin to hope again. I, I, I already have my closure. And I can't believe it. I, I, don't go back there, so. I could just start, I could just do a post-mortem. I could just talk about how good he was. I could just remember him. You know? But Jesus said, mm-mm. Because I gave you my word that the sickness was not unto death. I gave you my word that the sickness is not unto death. I, and I'm not going to allow my word to fall to the ground. You know, you know I was reading the book of, Sal, of, of, the book of Samuel. And the Bible said that God did not allow none of Solomon's word to fall to the ground. How much more Jesus? Jesus said, no. Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha. Yeah, so we read that already. Martha said, by this time he's tinkered. So, I mean, Martha was probably his biggest alive while he was alive. But this was now too much for her. Jesus says unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Now, this is a very popular scripture. Preachers love, preacher love this scripture. If thou wouldest believe. So, you know, the common saying is that we have to believe to see. We have to believe to see the glory of God. The world have it in reverse. The world says seeing is believing. Right? They put it the other way around. But Jesus said, if you want to see the thing, you have to first believe that it's, it's possible, it's going to happen. And the belief is going to be what birthed it into existence, as it were. So Jesus said, Would set us nigh unto thee, um, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Thou, if thou wouldest believe the glory of God. Continue. Then they took away the stone from the place. So they, they took away the stone. Um, I would love to be there when they are taking away the stone. You know, I would love to see the attitude of the people. Were they murmuring? I said, sure. Man, done that already. Or were they doing it, doing it with hope? And great, or, you know, were they doing it with hope and with great anticipation that Jesus is going to raise the man from the dead? You know, I would love to know their mind. The Bible never says it. But the Bible said they, 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 um, they, were, they, they, they rolled away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou ha hast heard me. And I know that thou heardest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus wanted them to believe that you know, he was from God. He was sent by God. And when he had thus and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave cloths. And his face was bound about with a napkin. 
Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. So Jesus, Jesus, Jesus um, caused Lazarus to, to, to be risen from the dead, right? This is a big thing. Now, um, now, um, at the beginning, the Bible says that, you know, the Bible says that at the beginning of, of the scripture, that the, the, the sickness was not unto death, but for the glorification of God. So, sometimes we will go through some things. Um, bad situation as it were sometimes. And it's not because of what we did or what we didn't do. But sometimes it's because God wants to get some glory out of our situation. And, you know, these persons should count themselves worthy that God selected them. All of them. Lazarus had to die for him to receive some glory. Martha was made very sorrowful, wept, maybe for days, and Mary also. And so the impact of this, you know, would be, as it were, affected the entire family. It would have affected Lazarus the most because he would, the one that died, it would have affected Mary and Martha because you know, they were probably the closest to him. It would have affected the community, maybe a little less than how it affected, you know, Jesus, um, Martha and Mary because their sorrow was not as much. You know, they didn't grieve as much. But, but the impact of it, the impact of it would have, um, the impact of it would have um, revert, you know, would have echoed throughout the entire community throughout the entire community. And because of it, we, you know, we, 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 we come to know and to understand that Jesus was not just a man that can heal people. By then, he would have already, already established himself as a man that can, can cause the blind eye to be open and a man that can um, heal the sick. But now, because these folks suffered for him, you know, we received the revelation that he was able to, um, to raise the dead, right? But the story never stopped in here. Um, let, let, let us read again further down. The Bible said, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the thing which Jesus did believe on him. So you see, many of those people that was in the thing that was that was personally involved in it would have now gotten a great belief because, you know, they were there when everything happened. Continue. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus had done. So some people went to the Pharisees and make a complaint. Then, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we, for this man does many miracles? Now, now this is the thing that, that bothers me. Why the Pharisees could not just believe like everybody else? Right? They admit that, look here, this man did many miracles. They would have seen Lazarus. They would have seen Lazarus. That he was dead. You know, and they saw that Jesus raised him. What else do they need to believe that he was the Christ? What else? You know, so they didn't want to believe. Continue. So hear what they said. If we let him thus alone, if we leave him alone, all men will believe on him. So what is wrong with that? And the Roman shall come and take away both our place and our nation. So they, were, they, weren't, they weren't concerned about the truth. 
they were concerned about position. They were concerned about their nation and they were concerned about their place, their position. They weren't concerned about the truth and whether this man truly come from God. That wasn't their agenda. They just want to, they just want to secure their position and their place. We have, to, we have to try hard not to come to the place, this place where, where the Pharisees is, or the Pharisees were, because it will mess us up. Continue. Let us move on quickly, because in the interest of time. And one of them, named Cephas, being a high priest, that same year said unto them, He know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. All right, so we're going to stop here and we're going to move to, to, just in the interest of time, to, um, we're going to move to um, St. John 12 and verse 1, because that is not the end of the story. A lot of time, as preacher, we stop here, but that's not the end of the story. Let us move to St. John 12 and verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Again, Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Can you imagine? This man that was dead... And, he and God raised him from the dead. He was now there sitting at the table to eat. Let me tell you, man. The Bible says that many believe upon Jesus because he, rose, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And then because every time they see Lazarus, it was a testimony of the awesome power of, 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 of Jesus. He was a walking testimony. Every time people see him, they said, yes, man, Jesus is the Christ. You know, Jesus can do a work in your life so that your existence, your existence, you being alive, is a testimony to others that God is God. And that is where Lazarus was. And then, you know what happened? It, it, it blows my mind. It, 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 it blows my mind. The Bible said, the Bible said that because of this, because people were seeing Lazarus, and every time they see Lazarus, they just give glory to God because they remember that this man was dead for four days and, and Jesus rose him from the dead. You know what the Pharisees did? The Bible said the Pharisees plot. To kill Jesus. But not only Jesus. The, the Pharisees plot to kill Lazarus. <laughs> Can you imagine? The Pharisees said. Look here. Because of you Lazarus. Because you were dead. And God raised you from the dead. Everywhere you go. People are saying. See the man there. That Jesus raised from the dead. And. People are now believing. More and more people are now believing on Jesus. So Lazarus, so, so, so the Pharisees said, we're going to kill him. The only way we can stop this is to kill him. Sometimes you will get to a place where, you're, where people want to, you know, put you out of the way, kill you. Because just your existence is, um, is a testimony of, of, of what? Of, of the goodness of God. Right? Just your testimony is a, just, you, just your existence rather, is a testimony of the goodness of God. Now, verse 2 says, there they, they, So there they made him a supper, 
Martha served, we said that before, but Lazarus was one of them that, was, that sat at the table with him. Continue reading. Continue. <laughs> then took Mary a pound of ointment. So now we understand, we understand why Mary did this. This is Mary, you know, the brother of Lazarus. Sorry, the sister. This is, this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Right? The Bible says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment, of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the, and the house was filled with the odor, the odor of the, anoint, of the anointment. Now, this is, this, is, this is the end of a, trial, a, 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 a great trial in her life. Now, the truth is that, the truth is that maybe, well, we know Mary loved Jesus, right? We know Mary loved Jesus. And we know she sat at his feet and all of that. But... I believe that the things that she went through when, when her brothers got sick and eventually died, what she went through, it brought about another level of praise in her, another level of appreciation. Maybe she wouldn't have, maybe she, she wouldn't have broken the, the thing before Jesus if she had not gone through this trial, you know. No, maybe she wouldn't do it. But because of what she went through, you know, it pushed her. And she was now, I believe that the entire family probably was now at a different level. And their faith was at, was at, was at a place, you know, where it's like it was perfect faith that they have in Jesus. There was nothing you could tell them that Jesus couldn't do. And so we see where, you know, through this trial, we come to understand, and let me go back to my slide, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Okay, move on. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm wondering, should we stop here or should we continue? All right, go to the next slide. So the next thing we want to look at, the next I am statement we're going to look at, and again, take out your Bibles, people, because we're going to be doing a lot of reading. Um, you know, I believe the Word of God is the Word of God, and, you know, the Word of God is powerful. And so, yeah. So let us turn to the scripture in St. John chapter 12, verse 3. The Bible says, Sorry, that's not the scripture. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to go to Psalms um, 23. But there's another scripture that we want us to look at. That speaks. Yeah, let us look at Psalms 23. And I want you, and I'm going to give you a little moment. I'm going to give you a, just a little moment. Well, most of us know the Psalms. The Psalms, Psalms 23, right? Most of us know it. I want us to identify. I want us to identify some of the role that Jesus played as the Good Shepherd. All right? So I think it's in St. John the Bible. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd and I know my sheep. And I am known of mine. And I am known of mine. All right, so we know we know that that scripture there in um, in Saint John. So 
So Jesus says that um, he is the good shepherd, you know. He knows his sheep and he's known of, of his sheep, right? Um, now, I want you to try and... Yes, yeah, so it's John 10, verse 27. He says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. All right, verse 28. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of, of mine hand. Okay, so, so we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. Not just a shepherd now, but he is good at it. He's the good shepherd. Um, now let us look at some of the characteristics of the good shepherd. The first one we want to look at is that the good shepherd... Yes, yeah, so verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. So, the, the first thing I want to look at is that the, the Bible says that the good shepherd, he knows his sheep, and he's known of mine. When, when we look at, you know, there is a time in the Bible where Jesus said, he shall have said to them, depart from me, I never know you. You know that scripture? When he said, depart from me, I never know you. Now, obviously, he's not speaking about his sheep there, or his true sheep there. Because the Bible says that the good shepherd knows his sheep and is also known of him. Right? There's a scripture that says, my sheep know my voice, or hear my voice, right? and a stranger they will not follow. So another, another, there are another um, characteristics of to know that you are actually a sheep of God is that, you know, you know the voice of God. Now, the question is, the question is, how do we know the voice of God? Or the question is, do you know the voice of God? Do you know the voice of God? And... How, how did you learn it? Or if a young convert, I, I, I sometimes help out with a young converts class, and they will ask some very interesting questions. They will ask you like that. So how do you know God's voice? Probably an older saint probably wouldn't even ask that because they probably don't want, to, don't want nobody to know that they have been saved for so long and they don't know God's voice, right? But a young convert will ask anything, which is why I love them so much. So he, the question is, how do we learn God's voice? Let us look at 1 Samuel 3, verse 7. Now I want you to ponder, I want you to ponder the, the 23rd Psalms because we're going to ask you to identify some of the roles of the, that, that, that the good shepherd play in our life as, as, as um, described in the 23rd, 23rd Psalms. But let us look at how Samuel learned the voice of God. So this would have happened where the Lord came to Samuel as a little boy. The, 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 the Lord would came, came to him and said, Samuel. Now the Bible said, Samuel went to his father and said, you know, here am I. And his father said, The, he said to him, um, sorry, um, let us read verse, in fact, let us just read it. Let us read verse 5 to 7. Eli, yeah. So it, it wasn't, his, I, I, I don't believe it was his father. It was actually Eli. That's what I wanted to carry. And he ran unto Eli and said, here am I. For thou callest me. And he said, I called I call not. Lie down again. And, went, and, and he went and lay down. So, Samuel, so Eli said, I didn't call you. Go and lie down again. Verse 6 says, And the Lord called yet again Samuel. But Samuel did not know the voice of God. 
So Samuel thought it was Eli that was calling him because it's Eli, him and probably it's just him and Eli in the house. So Samuel said, so Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not. My son lie down again. So the seventh, verse 7 said, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. So how do you know the voice of God? It has to be revealed unto you the way it was revealed unto Samuel. Um, so, yeah, go again, verse, verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I. I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. So Eli it took Eli a little while, but he perceived, I think, by his, just his own human mind. He said, you know, it's probably the Lord that called him. Um, so he said, um, he said, therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. So Samuel went and lied down again. So, so you see, Eli assisted Samuel in learning the voice of God. Um, how do we learn the voice of God? I mean, Sometimes the voice of God is hard to to the, the voice of God is hard to um, decipher sometimes um, because sometimes we have our own voice in our head um, that tells us stuff and we wonder, you know, is this God? Is this the voice of God? Um, and preachers can also attest to this, but you know. Um, a part of the process of preaching is that you will go to the Lord and seek a word for, from God. And sometimes, you know, it takes a while for you to recognize that, you know, this is the word that the Lord want, or this is the thing that the Lord wants you to speak about. I can give you my testimony here. For me, um, the voice of the Lord for me, <laughs> the voice of the Lord for me always come with, with great emotions for me. So sometimes, so I, 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 I bow before God, it's, that's just me. Um, and I tell you this, before I got saved, I wasn't a crier, I didn't cry. Serious thing would happen in my, in my life and not one ounce of tears would come. I remember my mother beating me to cry. She said, <laughs> she said, you know, you know, cry. <laughs> and she started to beat me for cry. So that, that, that's who I was, you know. But then, but I find that the, the for me, the void, the, 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 the voice of God come with great emotion. So I would just get a word. I would have a thought in my head. You know, God will speak a word, still small voice, a strong impression. You know, a thought that is probably similar to thought that I would have, you know, in terms of how it feels. But then I realize that sometimes these thoughts will come. I just break down in tears and... There's just this flood of emotion. There's just this strong anointing and this, this great emotion. The thing just, just impact you, just hit you hard. And it's sometimes it's some simple thing, but it hits you hard. And for me, that is how, that's, that's how I kind of perceive the voice of God. But I'm still learning. And I think, you know, it may be different for some of our other persons. I mean, if you wish, you could share how you learned the voice of God. Or how do you, you know when God is speaking to you? Another thing for me is that 
you just hear everybody with it, you know? And that, that's the thing that amazes me. You know, God give you a word, and you just hear everyone with it, right? You just hear everyone with the word. You just hear some random people just have, just have said a thing that God gives you. Um, I remember there was a time that I got a word about Samson and you know, I just hear brother, I think it was deacon, another deacon just come out and actually preach the thing. I mean, I say, all right, God, if you make him preach it, then me don't need to <laughs> You know, but that, that's another thing for me. But yeah, but the Bible said, my sheep knows my voice and as, you know, a stranger, they will not follow. The truth of the matter is that we all need to, to, to learn the voice of God. One other person said that God's voice is learned how everybody else's voice is learned. So how do you know my voice? My voice is very, um, you know, I don't really like my voice. It's very squeaky, very, you know, <laughs> I hate listening to myself. <laughs> you know, but, but how do you learn somebody's voice? Well, we learn, a, we learn a person's voice when we experience it. So when I hear a person speak, I can know. So I hear a person speak. Then I associated that, associate that voice with the person. So in the future, when I hear it again, I said, yeah, man, that's the voice I heard before. So sometimes the Lord will speak to you, and you, know, you didn't know it was God, like Samuel. But then further down, you learn that it, is, it was from God because the thing that the voice said come true are, you know, there is enough sign there to say that this thing was actually not just your thought, but it, was, it had some divine connection to it. And so next time when you hear that same voice, that same thing again, you are able to recognize it and to say, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it happened before. And so, and so we learn the voice of God. That's what I'm saying. We learn the voice of God, just like how we learn other people's voice. So I think I'm going to wrap up um, here, well not here, we're going to just finish the, um, the Good Shepherd and then the, for the rest of the slide we'll continue after because I don't want to go too long. So let us go back to the slide. We're going to go back to um, the, the, and let us put Psalms 23 up so we can actually just scrutinize it a bit to look at the role of the shepherd, the role that the shepherd play in our life. All right, so we can decipher something here. I believe about, you know, what God, how God deals with us. As a shepherd, the shepherd-sheep relationship. So the Bible said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Continue. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. What is this role that he's playing here? What is the role that the shepherd is playing here? Maketh me to lie down in green pasture. Well, what? Sheep eat grass, right? That's what sheep eat, grass. So, so David is saying that God provides the things that he must eat, Right? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He's saying that, you know, there is a provision of green pastures is probably the best thing for a sheep. You know, that's like heaven. He can just eat everything he wants. So he's saying that, David is saying that God, you know, puts him at a place where he's able to, um, to have the best grass to eat. So God provides for him physically. God provides for his physical need. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Again, speaking about the physical, you know. So God will provide as a shepherd. He will provide for our, for our physical man. The Bible says, you know, give us today our daily bread. God will provide our daily bread. He will provide the physical things that we need to eat. That was part of his role as the shepherd. Continue. So he provides, um, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his, his name's sake. So what is he speaking about here? Is he still speaking about the physical? 
I believe this is speaking about the spiritual. The sp so God not only provide for the physical by giving us green pastures and leading us beside the still water, but he also provide for the spiritual. He restoreth my soul. That's a big giveaway there. God, God will provide for our spiritual man by restoring our soul. And look at the next line. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So again, he is speaking about the path of righteousness. There is speaking about the spiritual provision. Righteousness that God will provide for us. So God provide, so he provides physically and he provides spiritually for us. Right? Quickly, because I'm getting the wrap up, wrapping up sign. He, he, he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. What is he speaking about here? What is he speaking about? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. This is speaking about protection. God provides protection for us. So he provides physically. He, sp he provides spiritual needs. And he provides protection for us. The valley of the shadows of death. You know, I look at it. Um, I, I say death is not very far from its shadow. I am never far from my shadow. You know, that's how I look at things, you know. I am not very far from my shadow. You know, so when the Bible is speaking about uh, the shadow of death, I believe he's saying that, you know, death is lurking around the corner. But the Lord will lead you through it, you know, and you don't need to fear. Why? Because thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Me comfort me. So, so um, I'm going to stop here. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here. But, but look at it again. You know, these are the rule. I believe that this is one of some of the things that God do. Some of, some of the things that the Lord will do. You know, as as a good shepherd. You know, he will provide for us physical, or our physical needs. The things that we need physically, he will provide them for us. He will provide for our spiritual need by restoring our soul and by, you know, giving us righteousness or, or leading us in the path of righteousness. And then he will also um, provide protection for us, you know. Um, and there are other things there because, we, you know, we didn't get to finish. But um, we're going to stop here. And um, God's willing, we will um, we'll take up, we'll pick back up at the next opportunity. Um, I'm not sure if there's any announcement. Let me check and see if we have any announcement. So there's, there's no announcement. So we can... Um, we can probably just close off in prayer. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. We thank you for being here with us, for leading us in your truth. We pray, O oh God, that whatever word was said here will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you would have it. Have your own way as I give you all the glory. You alone is worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Remember to greet each other before you go.